Hello and welcome. I'm Claudia Rizzini. I am the executive director of the Rackley Fellowship Program here at Harvard. It is my great pleasure to introduce Gabrielle Calvocoresi, a poet and this year Beatrice Shepard Blaine Fellow at Rackliff. Gabby has most recently been a professor of poetry with the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill and the Warren Wilson College MFA program for writers. They are also poetry co-editor at the Southern Cultures Journal. Gabby notes that their work has always been engaged with the act of deep attention as poetic and political practice. Their most recent book, Rocket Fantastic, uses patience, attention, and curiosity to examine gender and the body. As a framework for the book, Gabby used a symbol to denote a place where personal pronoun would normally be. This framework was to help make space for an uncontained queer body as an inextricable narrative element. Heraclid, Gabby is continuing to explore the possibility of lyric poetry through work on two new manuscripts. One is a book of essays and introspections on the shape of the lyric poem born out of their long experience with the form. The other is their next collection of poems titled The New Economy. This collection will examine the, the constant tension of genderless ident identity within a changing body controlled by biology. Gabby is obsessed with, obsessed with mystery shows and doesn't love gardening. However, mysteriously, it turns out that they adore watering, which is, an ex is excellent for their marriage to a partner who loves ga to garden. It is my great pleasure to welcome Gabrielle Calvo Coressi. Oh, wait, is it working? Oh, that's the last thing that's gonna work today, so it's perfect. It's so good to see everyone. Gosh, I'm so glad to be here. I'm immediately gonna um, turn on my timer because I'm the kind of person who's gonna go over. Oh, I can't find my timer. Well, we'll be here for three hours. Um, I first, I just absolutely wanna thank uh, Claudia, Elizabeth, Jin, Sharon, uh, Jay, Maria, every single person uh, who you know, really keeps this going. I really appreciate uh, them so much. And I just wanna say, it's amazing to be here with the fellows. I just think you all are so awesome. And um, I, it has been my dream since I was like 19 years old to be here. And so to be among you is just such a gift. And also to dear friends who came today. It's really nice to have friends. I didn't always, <laughs> and I probably won't <laughs> again at some point. Um, I thought today was going to be like this giant dirge, like elegiac <laughs> dirge for democracy, and that we were all going to, you know, I mean, and it's been a rough day. It was a terrible, terrible night in North Carolina, although um, access to abortion is going to hold, and so that's, that's a big, big win. Um, but I woke up to the news Maybe this is like not a big deal to some people, but I woke up to the news of the first lesbian governor in America. And I just wanna say like this kid, like could not be happier. That's me. I couldn't have imagined it. We couldn't have imagined it. Um, I'm gonna read a lot of poems. I'm gonna talk a little bit. Uh, and then hopefully take like a, a bunch of questions. I love to answer questions about everything, but I just thought, um, why don't we all just be in it together today and uh, I get to like introduce myself to you in a different way. Um, we can have a choice though. Do we wanna uh, choose your own adventure? Which way do we wanna wander? One, through the gender vessel, or two, through the death vessel? How many people wanna wander through the gender vessel today? Aha, uh -huh. how many people wanna wander through the death vessel today? <laughs> Luckily for you, it's a trick question and they're the same thing at least in my poems, which is what we're gonna talk about. 
I going to go first? I think because I thought democracy was going to end today, and it didn't, then Hammond B3 organ cistern. The days I don't want to kill myself are extraordinary. Deep bass, all the people in the streets waiting for their high fives and leaping. I mean leaping when they see me. I am the sun-filled god of love, or at least an optimistic undersecretary. There should be a word for it, the days you wake up and do not want to slit your throat. Money in the bank, enough for an iced green tea every weekday and Saturday and Sunday. It's like being in the armpit of a Hammond B3 organ. Just reeks of gratitude and funk, the funk of ages. I am not going to ruin my love's life today. It's like the time I said yes to gray sneakers, but then the salesman said, wait. And there, out of the back room, like the bakery's first biscuits, bright blue kicks, iridescent, like a scarab. Oh, who am I kidding? It was nothing like a scarab. It was like bright blue fucking sneakers. I did not want to die that day. Oh my God, why don't we talk about it? How good it feels. And if you don't know, then you're lucky, but also, you poor thing. Bring the band out on the stoop. Let the whole neighborhood hear. Come on, everybody. Say it with me nice and slow. No pills, no cliff, no brains on the floor. Bring the bass back. No rope, no hose. Not today, Satan. Every day, I wake up with my good fortune and news of my demise. Don't keep it from me. Why don't we have a name for it? Bring the bass back. Bring the band out on the stoop. Hallelujah. That kid. Oh. I mean, I really thought I was going to be, you know, but this is what the poems do. What a lot of my poems try and do is like, the beautiful and the terrible. I also want to say that, um, Maxine, can I just say that you're here? Like, that De Maxine Gordon, the great scholar, and also Dexter Gordon's widow, like this kid who used to like sit and try and play their saxophone with Dexter Gordon, like <laughs> on my little elf he, man, Hammond B3 organ for real. Life surprises you, you know. It really does. She ties my bow tie. This one's for you, governor. <laughs> she ties my bow tie. What you thought was the sound of the deer drinking at the base of the ravine was not their soft tongues entering the water, but my love tying my bow tie. We're, we're in our little house just up from the ravine. Forgive yourself. It's easy to mistake her wrists for the necks of deer. Her fingers move so deftly, one could call them skittish, though not really because they're not afraid of you. I know. You thought it was the deer, but they're so far down, you couldn't possibly hear them. No, this is the breeze my love makes when she ties me up and sends me out into the world. Her breath pulled taut and held until she's through. I watch her in the mirror, not even looking at me. She's so focused on the knot and how to loop the silk into a bow. My partner Angeline would say to me, uh, and she has often said, I don't tie your bow tie, I fix your bow tie. <laughs> And I was like, what kind of title would be She Fixes My Bow Tie? <laughs> she does a lot. Praise House, The New Economy, After and For Ross Gay. The rosemary bush blooming its unabashed blue, also dumplings filled with steam and soup, so my mouth fills and I bubble over with laughter. Little things, people kissing on bicycles. 
being able to walk up the stairs and run back down, Joanna's garden after the long flight to Tel Aviv, not being detained like everyone thought I would, the man with dreadlocks and a perfect green shirt walking home from work, one cold beer before I drink it and get sick, how peaches mold into compost in a single day, orange to gray to darkness into dirt. Her ankles taste. The skin right under the knob, delicate as a tomatillo's shroud. All the animals that talk to me, that I finally let them talk to me. The blessing of waking early enough to watch the fox bathe itself. The suction of a man's hands meeting another's on the street. Every single person looking up to see them. Bros, yes but lovely in the golden light with brims swung to the back. I want shoulders like they have. Want my waist to taper to an ass built like the David's. I admit it, this body's not enough for me. Still, I love it. I'll be sure, blasting out a Nissan Sentra's windows, bow ties, ridiculous blues, my mother's seizures, specifically that I don't have them that I can answer Ross's call or not, because we live harmonious and are always talking somehow. Tapestries with their gluttony of deer, fig perfume and also cypress, boxer briefs and packing socks and jockey shorts, strap-ons, soft and hard, welcome in her hand and in mine as I greet the real me the little shop in Provincetown, and that speckled dog that licks itself in that fresco of the crucifixion. Mary Oliver, I love her. I really do. The baseball she gave me that says, go Sox, though I love the Orioles. Old Bay on all my shrimp, and justice, and cities burning if people need to burn them to get free. My grandmother gardening in the late light, Sun Ra, the first time, Paris, even though I've never been there, natal plums, tattoos everlasting, clouds, Orion's belt, pushing inside her with both my hands, holding myself up, my weight, her grabbing and saying, God, fuck the neighbors, Casablanca, not knowing anything, angels, mashed potatoes, good red wine. Hi to everybody joining us online. <laughs> I'm going to read one more, and then we're going to talk about you, OK? Hi to everyone joining us online, all you beautiful people, particularly Angeline, who is joining us online. I love you. I miss you. I'm going to see you on Friday. Shave. Like the buck I am, I turn my head side to side. I hear the leaves rustle. I shake my head a little, and birds reel round the forest. I am no branch. My head turns to the side. I see out my side eye. The deep pool of the eye sees itself pool in the mirror. I oil myself till I am all a lather. My chest heaves out, so my full heart can abandon the ribs stockade. Where the bullet would go if the hunter were a good shot, that's where I place the razor. I make my skin taut. I pull my own neck back and to the side. I come for myself. Yes, I was a lady once, but now I take the blade and move it slowly past the jugular, up the ridge of my chin where the short hairs glisten. I was once ashamed. It was a thing I did in private my own self, my quarry, no more. Look how the doe comes round, and also the doves, and also the wolf who lets me pass. The fox offers me the squirrel's hide to buff myself to shining. There is no such thing except the smoothness of my face. Oh, the day I walked into the pharmacy and got that Mach 3 razor, and then like went home and put the shaving cream on and shaved. And I just have like a few little hairs 
although I love them, just like this person who is also like a poetics, like you could look at this, this vessel, this being, and kind of, I think in all kinds of ways, like know everything I'm working on this year and have always been working on and keep not knowing how to answer. I used to, um, this, this vessel, this vessel used to, uh, I lived with my grandparents growing up. My mother uh, was not, she was quite mentally ill, not well enough to raise me. My father was very young. This was a kind of energy, it's still an energy in the poem, so that's sort of missing, that longing. So I lived with my grandparents, and before my grandfather would go off to his uh, law practice in the morning, I would stand beside him, he'd get a chair, and I'd stand beside him. Amazing, I now think that he had me do this. I he would put his shaving cream on, and then I would put his shaving cream on, but then he'd get to shave, and I'd have to wash it off. What a bummer and also a kind of grief. What do you see when you see this, this vessel? Should we read this vessel for a second together? We can. I think I see a longing to make connection, right, in those eyes. Like, hi, I'm here. What else? What else do we see? Fringe. Tell me, yeah, fringe, right? <laughs> say more about that, Jill McDonough. <laughs> I mean, I wore... And a pleasure to put it on because that day, as I said, we'll be here for three hours. But that day, and this is important, this shows up in the poems. I remember my grandmother tried to put me in a dress that day to go to this birthday party. I love my grandma. She's a wonderful woman, but that was an area of difficulty. And I just couldn't. It was so painful to me. I just couldn't. So then we came to a compromise. I could wear... I could wear, if I wore this shirt that for some reason the collar red is like more feminine to her, then I could wear this vest that I thought was so tough. And you can't see it, but I could wear my cowboy fringe pants as well. Is there a star? I wish. I don't think I had a Marshall star, but if anyone wants to get me one for my birthday. <laughs> is there one in the... Jenny Boylan, leave it to you to see something I have never seen. I probably, there probably was like a sheriff badge under there. I don't see it. I wish... I, it would be like me to want to have like some kind of badge. Yeah, this kid. Howdy, Marshall. I think um, I was already imagining myself, I bo was born imagining myself in a different kind of body. I was, I was already writing at a very young age. I didn't know they were poems. I was making something, but what was it? And then as I got older, like this sort of thinking into like always trying to put on, to imagine, to live inside the vessel that just like my body just, it didn't look like. And this was like the 80s. And so it was both like this kind of joy in imagining, many of you have had this, opportunity, this idea in other ways, I'm just, or, you know, or opportunity in other ways, I'm sure. The joy of imagining like some other self for myself. My family also owned um, second run theaters and drive-in movie theaters. So like I was always at the movies being like, oh, I could do this. I was always looking this way. But also the deep grief, you know, saying to my grandmother, why when I wake up, I pray and I pray and I pray. Why don't I wake up with the body I want? And I don't think she really knew how to answer that question, but, but she listened to it. And that's a really big deal that she listened to it. Although I do have a memory of when I was little, one night waking up and saying to my grandmother, she had come upstairs to kiss me goodnight. I said, you know when you dream about a boy and a girl and they're kissing? I was like four. She was like, yes. And I said, in that dream, I'm the boy. And she just like tucked me in a little tighter and said, next time try being the girl. <laughs> there are people who are saying yes, because we know what this is. I kept growing. You keep growing into my imagination and myself. And when I was in eighth grade, which was the same year my mom took her life, I went to school the next day. That's another closet I lived in, the closet of mental illness and the closet of um, 
the closet of suicide, you know. I, I was in eighth grade and I read this book, The Outsiders. How many people read The Outsiders when they were in school? Yeah, like, if you haven't read The Outsiders, I recommend it, I really do. And if you have read The Outsiders, read it as an adult, particularly thinking about gender. When I stepped out into the bright sunlight from the darkness of the movie house, I only had two things on my mind, Paul Newman and a ride home. I was wishing I looked like Paul Newman. He looks tough and I don't, but I guess my own looks aren't so bad. I have light brown, almost red hair and greenish gray eyes. I wish they were more gray because I hate most guys that have green eyes, but I have to be content with what I have. My hair is longer than a lot of boys wear theirs, squared off and back and long at the front and the sides. But I am a greaser and most of my neighborhood rarely bothers to get a haircut. Besides, I look better with long hair. Essie Hinton was 15 years old when she wrote that in her English class and then she sent it out to be published. <laughs> and she, Sue Hinton, but she decided to name herself S.E. Hinton because she didn't think anyone, she didn't, th she didn't seem to think that they wouldn't take a book by a 16 year old, but she did not think they would take a book that was written by a girl. I remember seeing this first paragraph, I think about this sentence probably three or four times a week, every, every week of my life. And have you ever had that moment, like whether you're a poet or a scientist or anything like else, like you just like read something or see something and all of a sudden there's a kind of connection to you? Yeah, like when you're young. I was a big reader, but this was the first book where I was like, oh my God, there I am. And then the movie came out and this is what these guys looked like. And I was like, I want to look just like you. I wanted to look like Soda Pop, but that's Pony Boy. And that's Johnny. It's also like if you watch film, like all these guys want to do it. But they also though look like butch lesbians. They do, like of a certain era, like of the era I came up in. Poetics are everywhere. My poetics were somehow growing inside me and I didn't even realize it. These were also Pony Boy's parents had just been killed. And he was 14 years old and I was 13. There were so many ways I felt seen in that book. And so then I'm like reading and reading. And all of a sudden, in the middle of this book, I love how people are like swooning. They're like, oh. How many people like, I don't know, I'm interested to know in the room. Are there people in the room who this poem in that book was one of the first like sort of poetry experiences you had? I like that there's like two poets who are like, yeah. And I'll tell you, I grew up in New England, so I was like lousy with Robert Frost. Like Robert Frost was everywhere, but I just, <clears throat> I had a different impression of Frost, which then changed as I grew up in my poetics. I actually, he's become one of my great like guiding lights. I don't think I understood like how complicated those poems are and how terrified he is of everything, just like me. Um, but this poem appeared. Would it be so weird for all of us to read aloud? You don't have to, but like if I start and everyone wants to read aloud, just to feel it. Nothing gold can stay by Robert Frost. Nature's first green is gold, her hardest hue to hold. Her early leaf's a flower, but only so an hour. Then leaf subsides to leaf, so Eden sank to grief. So dawn goes down to day, nothing gold can stay. My mom had just died. I couldn't talk about it with anyone, not even necessarily because like people didn't want to talk about it with me, maybe, but I didn't have language for it yet. I mean, this is a central, I think, thing that was also growing in my poetics. There was a lot of silence. There was a lot of stuff I didn't know how to make language for, and how could I push into that, right? I had this body that I dreamt of, this kind of golden, golden body that I dreamt of that I didn't live inside. So I just lived in the world of my imagination all the time. And I was aging, I was getting older. Even then I kind of knew it. I was about to leave my, you know, I had left my grandparents' house. I, where did you feel this poem in your body? Where do you feel this poem? Will you touch it? And, may, and if you don't feel it anywhere in your body, that's totally okay. Where do you feel it? I feel it like here a little bit, but also I was with some students recently and a lot of them said they feel it right here. That moment 
but only so an hour. I had also never really, I lived in grief, I think kind of all the time, but I never thought about grief. This was, I remember, also thinking of that word in a different way. So Eden sank to grief. So dawn goes down to day. I think the reaching in my poems comes from this. Oh, stay, stay, stay. Stay, stay, stay. And of course, then in the movie, this happens. One morning, I woke up earlier than usual. The church was colder than ever. Capitalism. Golly, that was sure pretty, huh? Yeah. It's like the mist is what's pretty, you know? All gold and silver. Too bad it can't stay like that all the time. Nothing gold can stay. Huh? Nature's first green is gold. Her hardest hue to hold. Her early leaves a flower. But only so an hour. Then leaf subsides to leaf. So Eden sang. To grief. So dawn goes down today. Nothing gold can stay. Where'd you learn that? That's what I meant. Robert Frost wrote it. <laughs> I always remembered it because I never quite knew what he meant by it. Well, I never noticed. Colors and clouds and stuff that you kept reminding me about. Kind of like you were never there before. Yeah. I don't think I could ever tell Steve or Tubit or even Derry about the clouds and sunset. Just you and Soda Pop. Maybe Cherry Valance. Guess we're different, huh? Shift, yeah. Maybe they, uh. Maybe you're right. I was also so desperate for that kind of like friendship. <laughs> it's pretty unbelievable to me. Oh, I can't, can the tech people tell me I can't advance back? It's not the biggest deal in the world. Um, that movie, that moment, that way of poems coming into me at that time in my life when I couldn't find language for anything, it was also a moment where I was really realizing I was a lesbian. I was really realizing that I, for various reasons, didn't know that I would ever have the body that I dreamt of. And it was also when I started writing poems. So people ask, like, what am I working on this year? And a lot of it is getting back to this moment in my life, like, which I'm always in, but like, can I finally articulate it? Can I finally like, figure out how to talk about this body that makes no sense to me? And then, here I am at 48 years old on Friday. I'm just gonna say, because there's probably people watching experiencing this, maybe other people, I've been bleeding every single day for seven months straight now. It's a lot. Especially, I'll tell you something, when you're imagining, right? You imagine this other kind of body that just doesn't even, like that process doesn't exist. And what does that do to your poetics, too, is something I'm thinking about, because I'm having a really hard time writing a poem right now. I'm also, this is for another talk, or maybe if we're here till 7 tonight, I'll talk about it. Um, I know, people want to get to our great lunch. But um, I've, I don't, I'm someone who has, grew up with a strong prayer practice, and I pray multiple times a day. Just like talking to God. That was something I did a lot during this time. I didn't have a lot of people to talk to. And I can't pray right now. I try. At night, like when I wake up, which is often a time I would do it, I try. I'm having a very hard time writing a poem, and it's interesting to me, I'm also having a hard time praying. No, not, not praying, but knowing what that is. Has anybody ever had a time like that in their lives? I don't know. I am. My perimenopausal body cistern, disappointing how surprising. 
bled all day. Stopped bleeding, bled some more. Went to the doctor who reached inside the woman body I try to live with, make peace with, but also ignore. Sad tenant, my uterus. One day, the tenant turned out to be my landlord. All day I wonder what it means. Clock I know as well as I know anything, but also never wanted, and also won't give up. In the history of my light body, it will show I could have been another. The shots, the surgeon's blade, that freedom. But I hold on. Not out of fear, well maybe, but also this body I fought for. Timid skin sack that grew into a kind of magnificence I'd not expected. I tie my bow tie around my neck that's not quite the neck I want. But still the neck survived. Hours on the floor begging for my life, bent head crying in the bathroom, bent head walking by the boys yelling hog and dog and ugly as an animal. It's confusing. I protect the breasts that I live without in my mind's eye. I look for hours at men's trousers and kimonos and bleed all day. My mind says, take it out. And though it's one step closer to the true self I want, also I'd miss it in ways I can't explain. Burnt off scroll. I'm a mirror of a mirror. When I was eight at daycare, my friends pulled me aside to talk about a sex change. All of us in our Catholic uniforms, Meg, Emily, Nadine, and Brian, who got kicked out because of me. That's later in the story. We drew me in the sand. We planned and wondered how much it cost to be another body. But now I know my body. I pull up my pants and feel the lack of one thing as the muffin top reminds me of the persistence of another. Me, who's with me always. This pillow that looked over me, pillow of skin and fat that I'd call Rubenesque, it tried its best to cover me. So I worry over it. Strange companion, this body that covers me and bleeds all day without ceasing, I say, come on, I say, stop. Like I used to when I'd get too scared of one thing or another. God comes back to find me in the most confounding ways. Me and my body, who are often not the same. Um... One of the things I'm thinking about in these essays is I had, I had lots of options for this body. I have lots of options for this body. What in various parts of my poetics and in parts of my life keeps me holding on to certain kinds of health, but then other ways in which the dream is, is not allowed to come to fruition? That is something that I'm fascinated by. Oh, the death vessel. And then thinking about it in this time of so much loss is also powerful for me. During this time of also working on this book, I've been trying to think about, you know, I, I came up in my poetic life, I was in sort of the deep school part of poetry, like in college and stuff, um, during the mid-90s, like in the, so there's just no question that AIDS and the AIDS crisis, the kind of genocide that happened around that. It's a word I use. Anything I'm talking about with my body, with these kinds of things, it's really my views. What does it mean to lose and lose and lose and sort of have to work through that in your poetics? And then there came COVID. Maybe it's my body, maybe it's all the loss. Miss you, would like to take a walk with you. Do not care if you just arrive in your skeleton would love to take a walk with you, miss you, would love to make you shrimp saganaki like you used to make me when you were alive, love to feed you, sit over steaming bowls of pilaf, little roasted tomatoes covered in pepper and nutmeg, miss you, would love to walk to the post office with you, bring the ghost dog, we'll walk past the waterfall and you can tell me about the after, wish you, Wish you would come back for a while. Don't even need to bring your skin sack. I'll know you. I know you'll know me, even though I'm bigger now, grayer. 
I'll show you my garden. I'd like to hop in the leaf pile you raked, but if you want to jump in, I'll rake it for you. Miss you. Standing, looking out at the river with your rake in your hand. Miss you in your puffy blue jacket. They're hip now. I can bring you a new one if you'll only come by. No, I told you it was okay to go. No, I told you it was okay to leave me. Why'd you believe me? You always believed me. Wish you would come back so we could talk about truth. Miss you. Wish you would walk through my door, stare out from the mirror, come through the pipes. This is a form that I tried to make called the miss you. And um, that phrase repeats over and over. Like, could you, could you build a body of a poem or a body of a self that could not like necessarily bring the dead back, but could you open the portal? Wouldn't it be like nice for a second to open the portal? Just like we all be here together? And then when I go out in the world, other people write those. And so I've started to be sent like tons of misuse from people. And I just think, oh, maybe one day we should all stand and read them aloud and see like if we all just shimmer. Miss you, would like to grab that chilled tofu that we love. This is for my dear friend and the great uh, Kiowa scholar, Jenny Tonpohot, who knew someone could die of leukemia right in the middle of COVID. Miss you, would like to grab that chilled tofu that we love. Do not care if you bring, only bring your light body. Would just be so happy to sit at the table and talk about the menu, miss you. Wish we could bet which chilies they put on the cubes of tofu, our favorite, sometimes green, sometimes red. Roasted, we always thought, but so cold and fresh. How did they do it? Wish you could be here so we could talk about it like it's so important. Wish you could. Watched you on the screens as I was walking, as I was cooking. Wish you could get out of the hospital. Can't bring myself to order our dish and eat it in the car. Miss you laughing, miss you coming in from the cold and one too many meetings, laughing. I'll order already. I'll order seven helpings, some dumplings, those cold yam noodles that you like. You can come in your light body or skeleton or be invisible. I don't even care. No, you have a long way to travel. No, I don't even know if it's long at all. Wish you could tell me what you're reading, if you're reading, miss you. I'm at the table in the back. I went finally to like, oh, thank you. I guess it's almost time. I went finally to go get that dish, and they said, we don't make that dish anymore. And I said, fuck yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, Radcliffe. But you knew. This kid knew so much about, like, this poem knew such amount already, like, death and wanting a different reality, wanting a different self, imagining. Like, the poem was just pushing out of them, out of them. I sometimes think this little being was much more articulate than I am now. So maybe we can, like, find each other this year. People were like, what are you doing this year? And I'm like, well, I'm spending a lot of time at Mount Auburn Cemetery. If you ever want to find me, I'm at Mount Auburn Cemetery. I'm reading a lot. I'm writing, but like I'm looking for this kid who's still in me. And I'm looking also, oh, did I lose the clicker? And I'm looking for these guys in me. And I'm trying to learn to pray again. And I'm trying to write some poems. And I'm hoping that the portal will open a little bit more. I'd read another poem, but I think we're done. Yeah. What? Really? OK. There's probably some eval form that you all can figure, fill out someday. Like maybe at the end, they'll say to all of us, they'll be like, now you say what you thought of all the fellows. And you can just be like, that Gabby wouldn't keep their mouth shut. I just am so happy to be here with all of you. I'll just open one more cistern, one more little portal, and this is for, um, because, because 
going to college at Sarah Lawrence College really changed my life. Like all of a sudden the poet and the queer person and the trans person and the lesbian, like all these things came together. Not so much religion, different, well maybe. My choice was between an MFA program and um, going to divinity school and becoming a pastor. Um, but that was the first time I ever saw uh, Randall Keenan, the great writer Randall Keenan, who then became my dear colleague and my dear friend um, at UNC Chapel Hill and who passed away during the pandemic, also not of COVID, but we miss him every day. And also, let's bring my grandmother back. <clears throat> if you want to bring anybody back right now, the portal is open. <laughs> I'm opening it. Jesse Norman's cistern, time to dress for fall for Randall Keenan. The best of friends are sure to part one day. I can't remember who said it, but it's true. I wish the little church next door was there in person so I could hear them singing. I really do. I took my light body out to sea and marveled at the white clabbered in the door, the red shingle roofs covered with moss since no one's here to see it, dust to dust or shingle to moss, the chimneys leaning towards the ground. We didn't know if they would like us or not, me and Angeline. Little church next door in North Carolina, Pentecostal. I invited the pastor and his wife to tea like my grandmother taught me. Turns out we like each other very much. Randall, I was supposed to write another poem, but let's be honest, we know I haven't written in two years, or maybe more. I've been trying, I've been taking the bus and listening to Jesse Norman. This is where I'm supposed to acknowledge the pandemic and how long it's been since I've ridden the bus. Two friends have died in the last three weeks and neither one from COVID. What a stupid sounding word to try to fit inside a poem. One time my grandfather told me how Jesse Norman sang so well that all the cast was crying. Was it in Vienna? I was really young. He used to drive me on the tractor while we listened to her singing on the outdoor speakers, and I think how nice it would be to be so good at something you'd make everyone stand still and cry for joy, for wonder. I've been trying what seems my whole life since I stopped writing to describe the feeling of waking up in the darkness to the feeling of my grandmother's mink coat tickling my cheek her leaning down to kiss me after the four hour drive home from the opera, you would not tell me, think about the minx. Though we would of course know about the minx. Time passes. If I said she smelled like Oscar de la Renta, you'd know just what I mean. And I could tell you how I sat behind my grandfather on the tractor listening to Le Troyen, and you'd know just what I mean. I'd say, What's happening now? At the top of my lungs, not knowing French, and my grandfather would say, everyone's dead but the ushers, or things are going from bad to worse. His voice rising over the engine, which he'd cut at just the right moment so we could sit in the stillness and listen to her, still alive. Cassandra on the wall, he'd say, and I'd say, what's that? And he'd say, that's when no one will listen. The smell of late autumn grass in my nostrils. I'd rest my head on his back. It must have been a replay or a recording because she sang that in the winter, or maybe it's been so long I just don't remember right at all. I used to sit on the bus and listen to Jesse Norman before the world got sick. But the world's always been sick, as long as I've known it, I mean. I texted, do you know when she sings that song, The Summer Knows? And you said, I do. I'd wait up as long as I could for her to come up and kiss me, but I was always surprised. Little minx, horrible. But also, I'd do anything, literally anything, to feel my grandmother kiss me again. I'd ask, was she wonderful? And she'd say, we'll tell you in the morning. I miss everyone and feel so lonely. It's like an empty opera house inside me, like all the chandeliers just shattered on the floor. I figured I'd just speak plainly. It's time to dress for fall. 
Um, it's, uh, we're going to like do a Q&A, but I just want to say thank you to everyone. Thank you to everyone online. And I just want to say like, it's only November and, and I still get to be with you fellows for so long and it's just like such a gift to me. I just, uh, it's wonderful. So thank you so much for spending time with me. Thank you, Gabby. Oh. This was an absolutely wonderful talk. Thank you. So I've been asked to keep my voice up. So if I raise it too much, you know why. <laughs> OK? <laughs> it's not. She's mad at me. I'm not, I'm not <laughs> shouting or, you know, uh, raising it. So it's not impossible. OK, and also we have some questions, but feel free to ask uh, more if you have them. Yeah, there's like Slido. So oh, wait, yes, should I turn there. the? It's okay, because yeah, we're all set. Thank you. Okay, first question. We start a little like. We can get in it. Can you talk about? Can you talk more about being in the closet with respect to suicide? I know your poem deals directly with suicide. Has that been a way for you to break down the closet door? Door. Yeah, I mean, I think. Um, it's interesting. This is the first talk in a while that I haven't done a content warning around that, around suicide. And it was because I just gave a talk. I had begun giving a content warning, like saying, like, oh, I'm going to talk about suicidality. I'm going to talk about suicidal ideation, which is something I deal with and think about. Um, and then somebody got up in a crowd. This is an answer, I swear. Um, someone got up in the crowd, and they said, um, you know, I really struggle with mental illness. and..." You're talking all about like this closet, and but then like you, you give this content warning about suicide, and I feel like ashamed. This isn't me saying one is right or wrong, but I'm working through it right now, and I think it gets to. to <clears throat> I was, my sexuality was something that I couldn't articulate, and I sort of closed that door to myself. Gender was a door that I, I didn't know how to talk about it. I think closets as much as anything are not having language for something. I mean, they're also like imposed on us. But, but mental illness for me, and, and suicide in particular, and I think this is true for a lot of people, it's just there's so much um, silence surrounding it. There's so much discomfort. There's so much like of a way we don't know how to talk about it. There's also, I think, and again, like I'm just speaking for, my, for myself, there's also, I felt tremendously guilty when my mother took her life. I thought it was my fault. I was young, I was 13, but I, there was a kind of shame. Um, there was tremendous like fear. Also, am I, gonna, am I gonna kill myself? Does that mean I'm gonna do that? And then there was like, what will people think of me? I was already a kid, like in eighth grade, I ate all my, meal, my meals like at school basically in the girls' bathroom. So like, I, I didn't have many friends. But I remember going to school the next day and somebody said to me, like, what did you do last night? And I said, okay, it's like opening the closet a little bit more. I said, my crazy aunt killed herself. And then I didn't talk about my mother's suicide, I think, for about five years. I went to high school and I like barely talked about it. I think that um, within my work, particularly in a poem like Hammond B. Three Organ Sister, and like one of the, fir the first poem I read, um, I really am trying to think about like if we can talk about these things, if we can talk about our imaginative life, if we can put it out in the world, and part of our imaginative life might also be like wanting not to live some days, like then that. That can be a kind of liberation. People who need, who need help, there's also like, one should get help when one really needs help. But I do think that um, try, I am continually trying to pull out of the closet, push out of the closet. The, I said the other, I feel almost like it's a mausoleum, like of my fear, my sadness, the kind of fears of things like suicide that are imposed on me that I take in. I'm a good student, let me tell you. Like, I eat a lot of what I'm given. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it's a, big, it's a big part of my poetics. And can I also, like, bring the joy and the terror together? 
Like, is my mother ever not killing herself? No. Every minute of my life, my mother is dying. Am I also like eating the best slice of pizza like I ever had in my life at the exact same time? Yes, right? Like, and that was something that early in my writing life I didn't, and my living life, I didn't allow myself. I know we have other questions to get to, but I'll just say one thing. When I was in 2004, I was living in the Bay Area. There's some other people who were like in the Bay Area. And I had like a good old fashioned nervous breakdown. It was terrible at the time, but it was a good thing that happened to me. And I had a hard time getting out of the house. And so I set a rule for myself that I had to walk out of the house every day. I had to look at three people I didn't know and say hello to them. I had to make it down the street. But a lot of times that took me about like an hour. And one day I was sitting on the curb crying, like trying to figure out how to get farther. And all of a sudden, like thinking my life was over, thinking about dying. And all of a sudden I smelled this smell and I turned and it was a six foot tall rosemary bush. I was from New England. I didn't know Boston. rosemary could be six feet tall. That, changed, that was a moment of change in my poetics where I was like, still want to die. Look at this friggin' rosemary bush. I don't say it in a light way. I say like it took me 10 years to learn how to like write into that, but yeah. Thanks for that question. Yeah. So there are many interesting ones. So the next one is, can you talk more about writing into lyrics? As a, actually, no, this is not the one I want to ask. Can you say more about the role of religion in your life and work? Sure. Um, I grew up uh, in a house where my grandmother in Middle Haddam, Connecticut, was what I think of as quite religious and, and um, also like was within a church, um, little church, little Episcopalian church, where like religion was partially like what you did in church on Sunday, but it was really like things like you brought food to people who like weren't feeling well, you took people to the polls. Like the minister, who was a giant lesbian, I realize now, amazing, um, a fly fisherwoman, um, the, the, like you took, you, this was like, she would come to our house and eat dinner. Like people were in each other's lives and faith, faith was something like that you just built and worked on. At the same time, my mother, as she became more and more ill, took on a form of, um, of religious belief that was pretty terrifying to me and really was about a kind of damnation for herself that was terrifying. Um, and so for a long time, like, I was both terrified of religion and also very much like, searching for this space of, of um, sort of a, a vessel for faith. I always, though, my whole life talked to God, like all day long. Like I would just like talk and talk and talk. He, God, whatever God is, was probably so sick of me, but I didn't think so. Um, and I think that those, those hours where I would just like think alongside what I thought of as God or ask questions or be able to talk to an energy that felt to me I mean, in some ways, that never answered back. That's why I love George Herbert. All day long, my heart was in my knee, but no hearing, right? Poor old George Herbert. But also, like, living into that silence, speaking into that silence, and God as a space, faith as a space where I could work out really essential questions, that has continued the rest of my life. A great grief is that I... Um, I have talked about vessels, like I have not found a church vessel that I feel comfortable in again. And, um, and that's hard for me. Um, are my poems prayers? I don't think I would say my poems are prayers because a lot of poets do say stuff like that. Am I always, am I constantly praying in my poems? Yeah, I think all the time. And it's terrible for me right now that, I mean, I woke up last night and I was like about to, you know, pray which for me is just talking. I, I like to name every single person in my block and in my neighborhood that I know and wish them well and health. I do it for everyone in the house I live in, you know, right now I sort of think about. Um, but I used to be able to then build that into something else and I can't do it right now. And uh, it's a tremendous grief. So when people also talk about like how religion and faith work in my poems, uh, Man, right now, like, it's a form I'm really, I'm having a hard time with. But I keep trying, which is also what we do, I think, with art as well. Do we do that with art still? We keep trying, yeah. Okay. Um, 
We talked earlier about questions about practice, and mm -hmm. we have a few. The first one said, I love your work. I love your work. Do you have a is. practice, other than studying at a blank page, that contributes to the production of one of your beautiful poems? Yeah. How many minutes do we have? Do people want to make something for four minutes? Yeah. Do you have your phones with you or anything like that? I can do this. I can talk it through. And then, um, was that possibly someone named Oliver who asked that question? Doesn't, we don't have the names here. I'm going to bet that's Oliver Baez Bendorf, the great poet and student of Linda Berry, um, who Ebony Flowers is also. If any, I'll say like something that I might do, and if people in the crowd wanted to do it, hey, why not? I do, I have lots, writing, writing does not come easily for me, and so I have lots of ways of getting into it, drawing, making things. Um, one thing that I love to do is, I'm really obsessed with maps, and I like the idea of like a map that's like a cistern, like a deep map. And so often I'll start like a, a, a day or just like a practice, and I'll say, where do I come from? Like, there's that little being up there. Where do I come from? So I can say that to all of you. Like, where did you come from today? How many ways could you answer that? Maybe you came from 80 whatever Brattle. Maybe you came from Cafe Tati. OK. But could you draw your vessel? Could you, how far, how deep could you go into where you came from? What were all the smells? What were all the sounds? What were all of the sensations? I'm very interested in what are the senses that like you didn't prioritize today? So if somebody said, well, where did you come from? Well, I came from Brattle and the leaves were orange, but what did it smell like? What did your feet feel like in your shoes? This also comes from a, a Buddhist practice, which is, um, what did your feet feel like in your shoes? So if we had more time, and if you want to do it later today, writing every sense, every kind of, how deep in the archive of yourself could you go, right? Because I also came from my grandmother's knee surgery, which I was thinking about this morning, how like it really was the end of her. I came from them cutting the ring off my grandmother's hand like when she was in the hospital. I came from, I was thinking about this today, I came from Jackie McLean and Dexter Gordon, You Taught My Heart to Sing, because I've been trying to like, I tried to play that when I was little. So the exercise, the prompt would be, write everything, and instead of thinking of the page as this, where did I come from, could you go deep, 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 deep? Could you make that sort of deep gong of that experience? Let yourself go for 15, 20 minutes. Draw it. And then think to yourself, what's going on just outside of that? What does it mean to go just outside of that and say, what's happening? And draw the vessel of that. Write the vessel of that. And then after you've written and written and written, just like N.K. Jemison, Jemison when they talk about their world building, at the end of like two hours, or just playing around with that, write a 10 line poem. And in revision, try to have no line longer than nine syllables that is, that is a b autobiography of that, where I came from. You also can get a thousand poems out of that exercise. Or, but I think it's probably also good for a scientist. I think it's good for a journalist. Where did I come from? Yeah. Thank you, Gabby. This is all we have. Thank you all so much. Thanks, everyone. And thanks to everybody online. I really, um, I really appreciate you. This is all we have time today. Uh, I want to thank the audience here in the room with me and our audience online. You can find, at Radcliffe, we have a lot of programming. programming. You can find more events online at radcliffe.harvard.edu. You can also watch videos of past events at the same website. Thank you for joining us today, and have a great rest of the day. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. -bye. Bye,